Exploring the Winter Sky Part 1 with Andrew Fazekas from National Geographic. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we begin a two-part series exploring the winter sky. We're going to look at what you can see using just your eyes. We're going to welcome Andrew Fazekas back to the show. He is National Geographic's Night Sky Guy, and we're going to talk about exploring the winter sky using eyes alone. We're also going to take a look at how to view the Geminid meteor shower, which is peaking on the nights of the 14th and 15th of December. Now, winter is often considered the best season for amateur astronomy. Heat rising off the ground in summer can make for wavy air, similar to heat rising above a chimney, distorting views of objects behind it. The cooler conditions of winter reduces this effect, providing better, better viewing throughout the winter season. Now, viewers in the Northern Hemisphere can head on out a little after 8 p.m. this December to see Orion, one of the easiest constellations to find, hanging out above the southeastern horizon. Look for the three stars lined up as the belt of the celestial hunter. Just beneath the belt, you should see the Orion Nebula, a stellar nursery appearing as a fuzzy patch of light, making up the center of the three stars of its sword. Now the crazy bright star, a little beneath Orion, is Sirius the brightest star seen in the skies of Earth. <coughs> Just above Orion is the bright yellow star Aldebaran, as well as the brilliant red shining dot we know as Mars. Now look on over to the west-southwest and about halfway up the sky, maybe a third of the way, to find Jupiter shining with a bright white light. For you early morning risers, cock a dindle, forget it. Yeah. Look to your west southwest a little before dawn for this dazzling display. Next up, we're going to talk with Andrew Fazekas, Nat Geo's night sky guy, about the wonders to be seen in the wintertide sky. We're also going to be discussing his newest work, National Geographic Stargazer's Atlas the ultimate guide to the night sky. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are delighted to be joined once again by Andrew Fazekas. He is National Geographic's night sky guy, for good reason. His new book, Stargazer's Atlas, The Ultimate Guide to the Night Sky, is just out, uh, available everywhere. So it's fantastic. Check it out. Welcome back to the show, Andrew. Oh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So could you tell us, um, we have to ask, what's what's your origin story? How did how did you get started on started in astronomy? <laughs> It goes back to my childhood. My uh, dad was a big uh, uh, nature lover, and we spent a lot of time out outdoors, uh, camping, fishing, really being out in nature a lot. And, you know, he taught me at a very young age that, you know, nature, while most of us think of nature as uh, what's around us in terms of of you know, trees, plants, animals, the rivers, the oceans, mountains, things like that. But it also includes the night sky, right? It also includes the stars, the heavens above, pla the, the planets and, and such. My dad really taught me at a very young age that uh, nature includes many different other things like uh, the, the space above, the heavens above with stars, planets, the moon also included. And mm. that's kind of followed me through my life uh, being really involved in in communicating uh, astronomy. That's something that's been a big passion of mine. I've done for 
uh, really the better part of three decades now. I've been involved in all levels of amateur astronomy. Uh, I've been the president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada in Montreal Center. I've helped build the observatory on um, a university campus. Uh, you know, and I've done countless numbers of workshops. I've traveled in many different places around the world, uh, looked at in deep sky preserves. Uh, and I just love, I never get tired of looking at the night sky and sharing my passion for the night sky with people everywhere. And I love to do it in different mediums and pushing the boundaries in terms of what communicating astronomy takes in different forms, other than just traditional writing necessarily. It can include other things like virtual reality, augmented reality, um, other digital forms as well. Um, and so it's just something that I've just never lost my passion for. And I just am blessed to have a career that allows me to explore that passion and, and share it with the world. Hmm. I have to chime in that uh, I had a sort of similar origin story. And for me, Carl Sagan was yes. an absolute idol of mine. I hate to use that word, but I, there's yes. no other word that conveys. I mean, I just wanted to go to Cornell and, you know, study under Sagan, you know. Of and, course. Uh, yes. And, um, but uh, so who were, who were your heroes in science growing up? Well, I mean, just as you mentioned, Carl Sagan was one of mine as well. I think just like millions of others, I was captivated by his PBS series back in the right. early 80s, right? And uh, seeing that. Um, but, you know, I've had other, like in, in, in Canada, growing up in Canada, uh, some of my mentors were real local amateur astronomers here. Uh, mm. And one of them, they were really fortunate that was part of the Montreal Center of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada was uh, David Levy, who oh, right, uh, right, gained, yeah. of course, yeah. great fame uh, right. because of his Shoemaker Levy mm -hmm. 9 comet that hit Jupiter back in 1994. And I was just very fortunate enough to have him also as a mentor and look up to him. Uh, he's an honorary president of our society. He comes from Montreal. He's a former Montrealer, of course, living in Arizona now. But he... Uh, Fantastic comes comes by even in today and comes by our center and speaks to our amateur astronomers in our uh, in our club and uh, definitely looking up to him. He was at a pivotal time in what I in my young career uh, looking at communication and so it's it's you know it's a it's a journey. It's filled with a lot of other folks out there that I grew up with watching on TV and of course NASA being a big you know, here are all those scientists that we I saw um, back at it in childhood with Voyager. The Voyager mission was really pivotal too. I grew up, I was a teenager during the time of the Voyager missions, and it sort of followed my entire teenage years, uh, you know, watching, uh, you know, the flybys of Saturn when I was mm -hmm. in, uh, you know, in junior high and then graduating uh, with the with the Uranus flyby. And right. I remember just thinking, you know, oh my gosh, 1989 and the Neptune flyby, where am I going to be? And I remember when the, the I remember Voyager that was well. passing yeah. by Jupiter, yeah. right? And, yeah. and it, <laughs> at the beginning <laughs> of the decade. So it was kind of like really Vo the Voyager mission and all the scientists involved there. Um, it was just, you know, I was like really into that and, and it really followed my, my youth. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time and the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will one day end. Meanwhile, stars, planets and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. It's amazing. And so I think most people, um, the exception of a few unfortunate souls, get to at least see some stars up in the night sky when they go outside. But it may seem either static, which it certainly is is not, or it could seem just so confusing 
um, that it doesn't seem to have, they don't know where to start. So if someone is, has always maybe loved looking at the night sky, but doesn't know the first thing about it, where, where would, where would you tell them to start? Yeah, I mean, definitely, you know, we're all born with an innate curiosity that is in humanity's DNA. I really try, truly believe that in exploration always. And we have that individually. You know, we may not be like a, a Neil Armstrong or a Stephen Hawking or something like that, where we are exploring the limits of science and exploration uh, on a grand scale like that, we can do it personally. And looking up at the night sky is a wonderful way to do that. And you really don't have to be a rocket scientist or a professional astronomer to really uh, understand what you're seeing, appreciate what you're seeing. Having that sense of awe and wonder is very important. And I think uh, getting those basic kind of knowledge is easy to do today. You know, something like with the Stargazer's Atlas, for instance, is a good starting point because it's not going to be the, the the guide that you take outside and put in your backpack. It's six and a half pounds. Yeah, I was, was going to mention it's, that. Yeah, It's a major book, right? So uh, it's something that you would curl up with uh, at, the coffee, uh, at the coffee table or whatever dining room table, and you look through it and you plan out what your observations are going to be like. You learn about the terminologies. You learn about the lay of the land, so to say, in terms of the night sky of learning some major constellations, mm -hmm. the star patterns, becoming familiar with them, translating what you're seeing in picture form in front of you in a book to what's in the night sky above you. That's the big trick. That's the big transition that people who have no knowledge about space need to make. And that's what I he love helping guide people and mm -hmm. just understanding what that point of light, even if you're just walking your dog and you see a point of light and you want to know, well, that point of light, it's not even a star. It's planet Jupiter. You know, it's in the right. South right now. If we go outside tonight, you can see planet Jupiter next to it is, is Saturn. They're the two brightest star-like objects in the evening skies right now. And it's just amazing to think what those things are. You may, you're not going to see them even with a big backyard telescope, like what the Hubble sees it or James Webb Space right. Telescope is revealing things. You're not going to see the universe in though that kind of intricate detail, but you're still seeing the photons of light coming to you, hitting your eye from these objects. Your eye, not up and on a picture. You're not looking at it on second or third party apps or something like that. You're looking at it with your eye and those ancient fossilized light, be, uh, light particles are hitting your eye, right? And that is what is... I think is what brings the awe and wonder. And a book like this gives you that kind of stable foundation of how to start doing that, how to do star hopping, moving from one group of stars to another across the sky. And then once you're familiar with the lay of the land, which doesn't take very long, 15 minutes, a half hour at a time, maybe once a week, twice a week, that's all. And then you can graduate to binoculars and telescopes and really start looking at what we call deep sky treasures buried within. In the Atlas, I go even to that next step. So once you do kind of transition from the naked eye views to something like binoculars and telescopes, I have actual tours uh, that I've curated myself in I terms of this. what I think right. are some of the, the, the fun stuff to actually start exploring within certain parts of the sky and it doesn't matter where you are around the world i made sure in this book that i treat my fellow stargazers down in the southern hemisphere with 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 equality because a lot of books out there are very northern hemisphere centric or right. even north american centric right. yes. uh, i've made sure that it's quite international anyone around the world can pick this book up and and find a use for it and travel through the the night sky with it that is fabulous. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about this book. You really put a lot of effort into being very inclusive. Exactly. That's very important is that democratizing astronomy is what I'm about. 
I was very fortunate to work with National Geographic because they believe in that. And they allowed me to really help curate this book. I'm, I'm the lead author on this book. I'm, I'm joined by a, a team of other writers who have contributed astrotourism chapters, uh, space travel as well. Uh, National Geographic is a wonderful wealth, uh, you know, uh, knowledge house of expertise. And it's just wonderful to be able to have access to it. And the fire hose of data that they have uh, in-house, uh, yeah, map, you know, the mapping, it's the incredible. cartography teams. Yeah. Um, what I love is also that they're so open and listening <clears throat> to a person like myself who's a uh, actual observer of the night sky, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and the one who, who teaches people about the night sky, educates, uh, to listen to things that do work, techniques that work, and things that are relevant in terms of, uh, you know, uh, explaining concepts and stuff. So it was just a wonderful, you know, two year journey to get this book together. Uh, and the images and everything is just also just fantastic. It's carefully curated this entire volume. Mm. And of course, um, one of my favorite things about amateur astronomy, and it's something which an awful lot of people should see uh, coming up in the middle of December is the Geminid meteor shower. Oh my gosh. Yes. I'm glad you brought that up. This, yeah. Yes. The, speaking on the, the December 13th and 14th, definitely go out. It's That is one of the best meteor showers, if not the best of the year. Yeah. A lot of people think that the August Perseids are uh, are the best. They used to be. Now more the Geminids have been taking over in terms of intensity. And, um, you know, it's Dece it falls on December 13th, mid-December. People are busy out shopping probably for holiday gifts. And the weather is turning quite chilly in, in the Northern Hemisphere, especially here in Canada where I'm located. We're most likely mm. have snow already on the ground. So it's, it's not traditionally the type of uh, time of year when people do go out, stand around outside and watch. But if you prepare well enough, even in cold climate, this one is worth it. You can see anywhere from 60 to 120 shooting stars per hour in dark sky conditions. And even from suburban sites, like from your backyard where most people are located, the cosmopolitan folks, you can see 20, 30 shooting stars per hour and throw some fireballs in there, unusually bright meteors uh, coming across the sky, uh, because that's what meteor showers are known for, is to contain larger um, bolides, uh, which, which are really spectacular visually. So the Geminids, the night of the December 13th to 14th, highly recommend it. Mm. And finally, what's next for you? What, what's your next project you're working <laughs> on? Well, I can't say too much. I've always got something cooking, mm -hmm. but I'm looking for also a, 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 another guide, another book, uh, but having a very different take on it. Uh, um, more of a kind of a touristy kind of thing. It's been something in the works for a number of years with National Geographic, potentially, we'll see, uh, but uh, very heavily based on visualization of what it would be like to be on other worlds. Uh, and so I'm really excited about that. That's been something that's kind of been sitting cooking for a while and having really amazing illustrations are going to be the key for this as mm -hmm. well. So I'm really excited and people can find, I'm, I'm always doing something online. I have a, a, a weekly night sky live stream that I do where I just pick stuff that I'm interested in the night sky that I recommend people go out and view. It's uh it's great because I, I get to talk to people from all different continents around the world. And that just really gets me excited all the time is being able to contact people who are not star watchers. And uh, they're very super casual uh, pe people about night sky and they're learning. And I love being on the journey with people learning. So that's what I'm, I do. And I'm planning on doing more of in the next uh, little while. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show again, Andrew, and you're welcome back on anytime. Uh, thank you so much. I love your show. Great to be here. Clear skies. You too. And that was Andrew Fazekas, National Geographic's Night Sky Guide. Check out his new Stargazers Atlas, the ultimate guide to the night sky.
The Chemnin Meteor Shower, perhaps the most spectacular annual meteor shower of them all, peaks from the 13th to 15th of December this year. Now, most meteor showers are the result of Earth running into debris left behind by a passing asteroid or comet. The Geminids, which are no exception, are created from a small piece of the asteroid 3200 Aeson burning up as they enter our atmosphere. Light from the waning Judas moon is going to wash out some of the dimmer shooting stars this year. However, the Geminids are known to produce up to one shooting star every 30 seconds. So this year's display should still be one heck of a show. As is the case with most things having to do with amateur astronomy, the Gemini meteor shower is best viewed from a dark location. Dress warmly and head on out to a location away from lights with a great view to the east for evening viewers or to the southwest if you tend to be a morning person. Why? What would make you get up so early? I don't get it! What else? It is going to be cold out in most areas, in fact, even here in Tucson, so make sure you bring a canteen or two full of your favorite hot beverage. Maybe soup? Have some soup already. Don't let me stop you. After about 15 or 20 minutes, your eyes should become acclimated to the darkness and you'll begin to see shooting stars more frequently. Instantly. Stay away from your phone while watching the Geminids. It's just full of bad news. Doom scrolling. It's also going to ruin your ability to see at night. However, if you have a flashlight app set to emit red light, that is perfectly safe to keep all that night vision you've spent so much time developing. Uh, meteor showers are best seen using just your eyes. Make sure to have a comfy chair available, at least one per person. Bring blankets and enjoy the show. Join us next week on the Cosmic Companion for the second part of this look at the winter sky. In part two, we'll take a look at, you guessed it, the objects you can see in the night sky this winter using a telescope, even if you've never used a telescope before. We're going to be joined by Michael Petrasco from Inside Observatory. Make sure to join us starting on the 17th of December. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, I'd love it if you could download, share, like, I don't know, maybe tell a friend about the show. I mean, it would be much appreciated. Visit us at thecosmiccompanion.com and sign up for our mailing list. You're, that way you'll never miss an episode. Check us out in Second Life as well. Just search for Cosmic Companion. Clear skies. Thank you.